So I am um, really happy to introduce you to Dr. Deborah Johnson Hayes. She is the chair of the Los Angeles Veterans Collaborative Families and Children Work Group. She is um, an adjunct lecturer and supervisor of interns at USC. And she's done some great work in um, LAUSD over the years, as well as working with our military families in the local area. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome um, Deborah Hayes. It's my pleasure to be here and certainly to hear of such a, a diverse working group that you, you have uh, uh, managed here. This is great. Uh, I also was, as the lady in the back there, retired, but I think I need an intervention. <laughs> Something's not right. But no, um, once a social worker, always a social worker for life, right? And we keep mentoring and giving back and learning, and that's exactly what I'm, I'm having the time of my life doing at this point in time. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to talk with you about military-connected families uh, in relationship to family violence and uh, abuse and neglect and domestic violence. I, for many years, did not realize myself that um, I was military connected, a military connected child. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran and um, in and out of service well before I was born, but uh, once military always in terms of the culture and, and adapting to that way of life. And I must say that I learned how to really tuck a bed tight <laughs> and uh, would as a young child, I would marvel at how fast my dad could eat a meal. I mean, because he, he had two or three helpings, and he said in the, in the Army, he would tell us a little bit, little war stories here and there. Not much, um, but you had to eat fast if you wanted to get full. But also, he, he had an injury, an injury to his eye. This fine, beautiful man, calm, well-mannered, um, had this one flaw, this eye injury, and I remember as a child asking him about it, and he briefly said, oh, it happened when I was in, in the Army. And so Army, war, and I see pictures, you know, in the back of our photo album with him in his uh, Army green wool uniform standing there with a gun at his side, and thought, my God, my daddy was in the Army, and he shot a gun, and he's got an injury. Did someone try to kill him? Did he kill someone? And I vaguely remember asking him that, but he never answered. But what we do know, what I know, as a young man from the Deep South, segregated South, being brought into the Army, joining because his family couldn't afford to send him further to school, he wanted to be a dentist. But he joined the Army and um, was part of the segregated army in North Africa and Italy. And at a time where, you know, there were some fierce battles. I don't know, again, his experiences, but you think about um, that growing up in that environment, very close farmers, you know, self-contained um, environment, and moving into the larger worldview, but certainly being put in a situation where you're at, in harm's way. But for him, it was all about serving the country, and that extended even beyond after you know his his uh, discharge. But certainly, in terms of our family, we adopted many of those values that he he carried in terms of faith, responsibility, you know, making sure that mission is done, not stopping until things are finished, loyalty. These are all values that certainly were family values, but also reinforced by his experiences, culture in the military. So this morning, what I, you all have handouts in front of you. I know our screen is a little small here, but you can follow along. Um, my intent is to, to share with you, uh, to heighten awareness of experiences faced by military families and service members, and to identify the stressors that are inherent to to the deployment as risk factors to family violence within military families. But we also want to talk about 
the resiliency and those protective factors that uh, are inherent within our military family structure and looking at that in terms of implications for supportive intervention. How many uh, of you are military, have served veterans? <coughs> Paul, anyone else? Well, thank you, Paul, absolutely for your service. How many of you are connected in terms of being part of a military family? Wife, spouse, son, da and daughter, okay. We also <coughs> thank you for your service. We know full that when um, the Army or Navy or Air Force, Coast Guard, any of our armed services calls on our men and women to serve, that their families <coughs> also serve in many, many ways and continues to serve post-discharge. 9-11, that's a day marked in certainly our, our minds forever. 9-11, September 2001, the terrorist attacks on uh, the Twin Towers in New York. As a result of that one act, we have had over two and a half million service members that were deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. From that one act, it's changed really the course of history. We're still at war, going on 14, 15 years of constant battle, constant exchange. But what's been different is that we've had multiple deployments, not just once, not just twice. We have reports of individuals being deployed five, six, eight, ten times in the course of these last 14 years. So why, why do people join? Why do, you, why do they join the, the armed services? And in this instance, with 9-11, we had uh, folks that really felt, you know, we need to get them. This is not okay. So that sense of patriotism, that sense of pride, wanting to pay back for a wrong in terms of our country. But just historically, people have joined the service for adventure, for travel, um, to develop some self-discipline, to learn a skill. As my dad learned, he learned uh, to not be a dentist, but to be a master mechanic. Um, to earn a steady income. We have a lot of folks in our community, certainly uh, dealing with unemployment issues and not being able to find a steady job or find a job that is, can pay uh, to support family needs or supplement family needs. It, many of our men and women are coming from you know, lower income um, um, families and joining, certainly for benefits, educational opportunities, then for many of us, there's a tradition of service within the families. Mom or dad served, grandfather, goes back generations. And so it's just a, a common occurrence that yes, you are, we do serve. This is part of what we do, we give back. And then there's those that also are leaving their community because they are not wanting to get into any more trouble and feel again that self-discipline that the armed services would be able to provide them is would, would uh, be helpful. So there are many reasons why individuals join. But here, um, in terms of the United States active duty, we have, uh, at this point, close to over 1.4 million. Um, we, for the last year and a half, we're talking about a drawdown in our service, and certainly many service members are being discharged or are certainly being returned uh, home. But I think we ask, you know, the question for how long, because I know uh, most recently we're seeing a surge in individuals being redeployed. Um, we have over 21.6 million veterans in the uh, United States. So that's you know, a sizable, sizable um, number of individuals who have put their lives on the line, put their lives on hold in order to serve the country. And along with that, we cannot forget, again, the families. Females comprise about almost 230,000 uh, members of the service. 
so it's about 15%. Um, and overall, veterans are about 18% are in the Guard and Reserve. That's a population here in Southern California that we really need to focus in on because it's not like we're in San Francisco or San Diego and we have a large population of active duty. Um, we do have active duty, but many of them are Guard and Reserve. And those are the families that most often uh, we forget about. And certainly that they don't necessarily always identify as being uh, military connected, military related. You know, they're still in the community. They have their identity as a doctor, a, an attorney, um, school teacher, mechanic. They have their identities, they have their, their work life, their business, and they have been what we call our citizen soldiers. Uh, but again, during this course of war, these last 14 years, or really last 10 years, we've seen an upsurge of our use of our Guard and Reserve. Okay. Welcome to California. California hosts the largest population of veterans. Uh, we have 168,000 within the state. Uh, of those, there are about 20,000 homeless veterans within LA County. We'll get a closer uh, closer understanding of, in terms of uh, the homeless veterans uh, as a result of our recent uh, veteran survey that uh, was completed just last week. Of that, we have about 2 million children under the age of two years. 42% of those children are uh, age five, 67 under the age two. Again, these are children of active duty and of uh, guard and reserve. Our military families are largely young. They are largely um, not only young children, but also their parents are young. 18 to 24 age group, 24 to about 35 uh, years old, they host the largest number of, of children. See, and I'll show you a slide that depicts that uh, a little more clearly. But, um, so we have close to 40, 60 percent children of active duty or under the age of 12. And of the active reserve, also very similar. You can see closer on it. Here in California, or in Los Angeles County, that next slide uh, identifies in terms of active duty uh, guard and reserve the numbers of children that we have here in LA County uh, based on their age 0 to 5, 6 to 12, and 13 to 18. Again, this is just active duty. We're looking at for a, about 11,000 children in LA County. We're not talking about Orange County or Ventura, but within just LA County have active uh, duty parents. But who knows how many parents, uh, how many children we have in the county that are of veterans, OIF, OEF, or who in are in veteran families, living with caregivers, grandparents, who may also be veterans, uh, going back to uh, Vietnam, Desert Storm area as well. So these families we know are certainly families that potentially are vulnerable due to um, their, their service. And I would like to talk right now about the deployment process. What is deployment? You know, deployment is a movement of an individual or military unit from one location to another, again, to accomplish a mission. What is that mission? It could be a number of things. It could be uh, mobilization, it could be just a support, it could be deployment for training cycles, humanitarian missions, we've had many floods and earthquake disasters that our Guard and Reserve, have, uh, California Guard have certainly um, been deployed to support throughout the world. There are peacekeeping activities and certainly there is combat. As I said earlier, the frequency of deployment has um, have been increased since the 9-11. Um, and with that, there are unique challenges for our service members as a result of that uh, being called up for duty. Certainly there's, there's, there's anxiety, number one. 
concern for safety, one's own safety, concern for their family. How are they going to handle this deployment? If this is the first deployment, or maybe it's the sixth deployment. Um, the length of time, you know, how long will I be deployed? Will it be for six months, for 12 months? Uh, gosh, we just had a baby. I'm not gonna be able to see my child for another 12 months. And when I talk about see, it's see your child in terms of being with them. Certainly with technology, our families are more connected and in terms of their deployed service members. This could be a good thing, but then it also can co uh, pose some, some uh, similar concerns and heightened anxiety among family members and among the service members. Let's talk about deployment and the deployment cycle. Who knows what pre-deployment is? Any thoughts or takers on what is pre-deployment? Hint. <laughs> yes, at that time, that one to six months before you're called, before you're called, you have notice, but your your date is could be anywhere from one to six months before. A duty. Could you imagine what that's like? That you're um, given notice that in two months you have to, at 18, 19 years old, prepare your will, um, get trained up, really get not only physically but emotionally and psychologically ready to separate from family, from um, your life here as you know it, and be ready to move forward connect, bond with your, your unit, um, develop and reinforce those skills that are going to help you survive but also help you maintain the mission. So those first two months, first one to six months is the pre-deployment stage. The next stage is the actual deployment and I know we've seen a lot of uh, footage, film, and some of you may have even experienced friends and family members who've deployed going that last step with them, saying those goodbyes, seeing them with their unit in full uniform, picking up their heavy bags and their guns and getting on that bus or getting on that plane or getting on that boat. And that is um, very emotional, very difficult time for many families, that letting go. But that deployment starts at that point and really um, those first months after are the time for transition and time for rebalance within the family as a unit. There certainly are changes in roles, not only for the spouse, but for the children. So we give it another two months of deployment. The next phase is sustainment. That's when the family kind of is right in sync. Everyone, we know what we have to do. Mommy's not here or daddy's not here, we each know what we have to do. And that sustainment period for many is like, well, you know, this is the way it's gonna be. And um, as tough it is, as it can be for many, uh, finding some balance during that period of time is, is can be difficult. Uh, certainly in a situation when you don't have support, support within your immediate community. Homecoming, redeployment is called homecoming. And that's the time where you know, you're know you so excited, as well as your service member is excited to be home, to come back. Um, some come back for extended time. Some may come back just for a couple of weeks and then be returned back to theater, or returned back to their assignment. Um, reunions, you think certainly, yes, it's great. But what happens when you've had your service member that's been deployed for a year? You know, routines, things have changed. You might have even painted the house. You might have even moved. And here comes your spouse back into the home environment that has been moving along without him or her. And there is still time for adjustment and readjustment. Uh, and certainly in terms of relationships, in terms of that spousal relationship, the coming back can be very, very challenging and one that needs certainly a lot of communication and support. And then there's the last phase is post-deployment, three to six months after returning that integration well and finally home, finally coming out and being around people, being around maybe going back to work, um, that, that phase. But with the 
physical deployment phase, there's also emotional cycle deployment. That first of anticipating a departure, the detachment and withdrawal from family, from uh, friends, um, that emotional disorganization that you, you may experience uh, as a result of not having that spouse, not having your partner um, involved in the family, certainly disorganization with the children, um, longing, wondering where daddy is, depending upon their age and stage of development. Then there's a recovery and sta stabilization that we certainly um, uh, see in terms of uh, the, the deployment process. Anticipation of return, readjustment, and then re reintegration and stabilization. So aside from the physical, there is the emotional uh, side of, of deployment. And that military spouse, man or woman, is the one that's charged to hold the home front. This particular uh, bracelet here says, his, he swore to protect his country, I swore to protect his heart. And for the military spouse, they take their role very seriously to hold up the home front, to reinforce family values, to keep things going, to set an example. And these are things that are expected, to protect what's home, protect their children, protect their, their uh, stake in, in the family. Military spouses, there's an extre extreme sense of strength, responsibility, loyalty. And in terms of readiness, uh, the readiness for the service member, the family also, the uh, service understands and sees that the family also must be ready. But what happens when you have an 18-year-old spouse just out of high school, both of you, and from some little town in Midwest, um, and that get married right out of high school and uproot, and you find yourself in Camp Pendleton, and six months later your honeymoon is over because your uh, your husband is being deployed or your your wife is being deployed, and so here you are, from totally. Uh, 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 environment totally different from now that you're you're left in and left in there's a sense of, of isolation sense of uh, disorganization and certainly often difficulties that come along with that that we see um, and then families need support young families need support this next slide I like it says I survived IEDs RPGs attacks and extreme living conditions yeah? Well, I raised both our kids for a year by myself. And he says, you win. You know, it's not an easy job. And the impact that we have uh, on the military spouse of deployment involves a lot. You know, there is certainly with the anxiety and the depression uh, that goes with having a loved one in, not just gone, but potentially gone in harm's way depending upon their uh, duties. It leaves a lot of, of uh, emotional impact upon the spouse, but then also it impacts the children. We see higher levels of emotional difficulties with children who have a, a, a parent that's deployed. This is not necessarily a question that the school is asking, you know, when you see a spike in a behavior problem, whether it's acting out or withdrawal. It's not one that we typically is asked, and certainly we encourage you to start asking the question, is this a military connected family? We're also encouraging our, our uh, spouses to let uh, those working with children and family know if in fact a family member is being deployed. Um, some instances it's not really something they want people to know because of family safety or maybe because of the mission that the service member has is, is uh, very confidential, but it does have an impact on children. This next slide over in the corner, you'll see a little girl with um, her dad. This little girl, I remember seeing her on TV because they, they brought her on one of the local news channels after her father was deployed. She was only four years old, and this was the second deployment that she had experienced with her dad, and they you know, proud, you know, to have him serve, proud to, to see him off. 
but she would not let him go. Four people tried to pull her away from him when it was time for him to line up with his unit and, and get on, on the uh, bus. So what did dad do in his good sense? He let her come with him. She held his hand and she let him go on her own time. But it was just really poignant to see and know that we are tearing the hearts, tearing the hearts away from the young children and they have a sense of not control over uh, what is happening. And in this one instance, his father just used his daddy's sense and said, you know what, let her line up and it's part of a ritual and let go uh, on her own time. And she did. And she was able to talk about it uh, and talk about the experience of being there with the rest of the men and women too. But it was on her own time that she was able to let go. Our children don't all have that that luxury. Daddy or mom may be gone in the middle of the night while they're asleep. And again, you know, think about the impact of that. Certainly there are fears, there's worries about the family member's safety. Um, again, we talked about changes in relationships. And there's certainly also maybe possible relocation of the family member. You have a, a family member that's left behind. They may have a child that has special needs. They may have several children that they can't adequately uh, uh, take care of and have family elsewhere to say, come, you know, while he's away, you know, come home. And so the family may be uprooted as a result of that. There are overwhelming emotions of grief, loss, anxiety, anger, confusion, sadness. It goes on and on. Some talk about that sense of just emotional numbing. You know, just, I don't feel anything. I can't afford to feel, because if I feel, I won't be able to keep the family together. That's on one end of the spectrum, and you have on the other end of the spectrum, uh, a spouse who may be feeling, you know what, I'm glad he's gone. You know, uh, now I can move on with what I need to do with the kids. At least we know it's us. But when he's here, things are so disruptive, things are so uh, uh, unexpected, we're glad he's gone. There are certainly factors that increase stress, include financial pressures, the uh, repeated deployments as I talked about, and also the length of the deployment, uh, and having young children, caring for sick children, also even caring for sick family members. Um, change in sleep habits, eating habits, um, all of these are factors that impact uh, the lives of the, the remaining family members. Yes, I returned from deployment 10 months uh, yesterday. How did you know? Hmm. Not really funny, but you know, deployments do change people. They change individuals because there's, they've had a, a change in, in their, their worldview their experiences, their life. Um, doesn't always have to be negative, but I think when we think about deployment, we do think about the negative part. Certainly the, the combat stress, the jumpiness when um, hearing firecrackers or car backfire, or not wanting to sit with your back to a door. There are a lot of different things that people kind of take a, and look at, well, that's because he's been in the war, that's PTSD. No, that's not PTSD necessarily, but that's some of the survival skills that have been trained into our men and women in order to keep them and their unit safe, their unit alive. So there is a big difference when we look at individuals uh, coming back and we look at their behaviors and how things we take for granted, they may be very hyper alert to, uh, but it's as a result of survival. But that does not minimize the fact that, yes, we do see and uh, many are experiencing PTSD. Um, traumatic brain injury has become the signature injury uh, for this latest war conflict because of the type of uh, bombs, IEDs, that are being built. Also, the bombs um, are built in such a way as that they, if they don't kill, they certainly maim and take the lower part, the lower limbs, and the lower part of the body. So we have 
many, many uh, individuals that are having amputations as a result of that, muscular skeletal injuries, back injuries, you can imagine um, carrying on a day-to-day -day those that, um, that's in combat, 80, 90 pound um, backpacks with materials, with all of their essentials on a daily basis for hours and hours and hours uh, without stop. And then there's the issue of uh, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, smoking um, that we see. In terms of uh, at risk, again, new parents, young families are uh, certainly at higher risk because they haven't had the experiences of uh, service life as long as some of our family members who've been in uh, the, the service for a longer time and know what to expect or have a better uh, support system around them. Um, certainly those that are single parents have a difficult time, may have a difficult time again with not having family support lined up. For a single parent before deployment, they have to have a child care plan. And sometimes those child care plans fall through and if so, there's no one to take care of your child, your child will be placed in foster care. And if you refuse to go, you, the, you as a service member may certainly end up you know, in the brig or being dishonorably discharged. In our community here, um, I've seen a lot of relative caregivers that are caring for um, their uh, service member uh, relatives' children. That's also an arrangement, but that's again something that we need to, to inquire and, and ask about, because uh, the child that's being cared for, grandmother or grandfather or aunt or uncle, they may not even have had a, a strong relationship with that individual before having to be connected with them, and vice versa. So that too also can uh, pose some concerns and risk you know, within the family. The idea of mission readiness and family readiness is one that certainly is continuing to be pounded by our armed services in terms of being able to really focus on the needs of the family, not just of the service members now. There are many organizations, the uh, uh, family readiness groups, uh, uh, fleet and family readiness, there are uh, many groups on base that are providing support um, and uh, within our different installations. But again, in terms of our community, I think it's our responsibility to, as you're doing today, to train up, to understand military culture, understand how it impacts on that child and family so that we can be ready and able to support these families, whether they're in the schools, whether they come to the hospital, they're in a clinic, uh, 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 however you're providing services for them, it's important that we, we are ready and understand their language, understand their values and their culture. Okay, risk factors, of course we know risk factors in terms of family violence, um, the relationship problems, financial problems, mental health, uh, the exposure or experiencing of traumatic events, um, previous physical, sexual, emotional abuse. These are all certainly risk factors that carry from generation to generation. But in terms of our service members, they have not only uh, the risk factors as I've just identified, but other risk factors that uh, put a family at, at risk include a military family at risk, include the length of the deployments, the number of deployments, the mental health history, not only of the service member, but of the spouse that's remaining at home, the children, any history of aggressive or violent behavior, again, exposure to traumatic events, and we know with war, with many of our, our uh, service members, there is a higher risk for exposure. Um, any prior history of substance abuse or self-medicating, um, that certainly is something to, to be in, uh, taken into consideration. But the other hand, too, is in uh, theater, there is a high anxiety, a lot. Um, and you can not even imagine what some of our men and women are dealing with. If there are uh, problems, there's the medic. 
that medic, you know, provides the dispensing of, of medication to help alleviate uh, anxiety, to support attention, focus in theater. And so we have some servicemen and women coming back on medication, having taken medication for various uh, issues and that they were having uh, during their deployment and may not maintain the, the level or may even um, abuse the prescription drugs that they were given in, uh, here once they get home. So that may also be an, an issue. Access to weapons. Also with service members, um, they know how to use them. They know how to handle them. They are locked and loaded at all times for personal safety. What happens when they come home? Do you think they just drop those weapons? Drop those knives? Those guns? Many of our service members, you know, continue to have guns in the family, in their home. And so there is a concern about certainly gun safety as well. Um, you can see that that service member, that spouse, that child are all at risk for violence, family violence in the home. Suicide rates, um, and a lot of the statistics that I have here, they are, it's hard to get a, a, a good handle, but just it suffices to say that um, many of the statistics are probably underreported. Um, but we do know uh, in terms of suicide, uh, that there are over 20, 22 suicides a day from our, our servicemen and women. Um, not only OIF, OIEF uh, veterans, but also from the Vietnam era as well. There's a heightened number of disability claims. Um, again, alcohol use associated with physical domestic violence in Army families. That's something that um, the Army has seen a tremendous increase in within the last uh, four years, increasing 40% uh, in terms of abuse and neglect. So the burden of war um, is great. Uh, in terms of the injuries, physical as well as emotional. Active duty as well as veterans. Um, we talk about domestic violence, domestic abuse, their uh, reporting of DV incidents uh, is higher than this 19,000. Um, there are 19,000 that met criteria to be entered into registry. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading that wrong. 19,000 reported incidents, but only 8,000. 45%, almost half, met criteria. The others did not meet criteria for whatever reason. Maybe the spouse did not uh, want to follow through, uh, or either command uh, did not want to follow through with that. There are, of the reported cases of DV, about a third of those cases involve the spouse as the perpetrator of DV against the service member, against the uh, service member. And with that, that spouse can be charged not only with domestic violence, but there have been cases where uh, that spouse is charged with the destruction of federal property. Because that service member is federal property. Okay, reporting. There's restricted reporting and unrestricted reporting for domestic violence and sexual assault. This does not um, relate to child abuse. With child abuse cases, there is no um, unrestricted reporting. I'm gonna skip a couple of slides just for the sake of time. Again, with... Uh, the statistics we see that you know, across all branches, Army, Air Force, Marine, Navy, um, that certainly child abuse uh, is something that is a concern and that we're seeing increases. Uh, in terms of child abuse, 
by spouse. When we look at it in terms of the service member uh, being deployed, child abuse increases during the deployment period. During the deployment and sustainment period, we're seeing increase of child abuse. Um, and it goes to, stands to reason that again, that adjustment, dealing with changing roles, expectations, the child abuse uh, high, is higher in terms of neglect. Um, that that spouse is working, maybe the children are the ones that are having to um, fend for themselves, you know, fix the TV dinners, um, watch babysit each other while mommy works or daddy works. Um, we see a higher cases of uh, domestic violence again after that reunion. And so why uh, is family violence uh, impacting family ready, uh, military readiness? Um, and why is it not necessarily reported uh, in a way that is uh, in a way that is, in terms of the statistics, you know, why is it not reported? Uh, the command may not deal with it uh, in terms of their uh, deal with the charges. They may, you know, dismiss it, not see it as something that's, uh, you really don't want to ruin your husband's career from that perspective, understanding that, you know, the charge of child abuse or domestic violence is going to totally change that family structure. That individual, if he is uh, charged and uh, uh, domestic violence is found, may uh, be discharged. So there's a financial issue. There are a lot of other issues as well that uh, self-reporting may not be reliable. Um, if they are charged, the spouse, the victim, may be asked to, to leave. If it's base housing, well, certainly that's an issue. There may be jurisdiction issues. You know, the violence happened in one uh, county. The family lives in another state now. There may be jurisdiction issues. These are some barriers that certainly uh, impact uh, reporting. Talk about resilience. Resilience is the ability to function effectively and grow in the face of adversity and challenge, and the lack of discomfort and of not returning to the way we used to be, but living in the new normal. Our military families are living in the new normal. And although I spent a lot of time talking and detailing a lot of the negatives, a lot of the difficulties that our military families face, one of the one of the things that we can say about military families is that they are resilient. In spite of, again, the negative picture that's painted, it's important for us to understand that and to adapt a strength-based approach as we work with our families in the military. By just the nature of the culture, what military families are, uh, are trained or reinforced their values uh, the, the sense of duty, not only for the service member, that extends to the family, that we are supporting mom or dad by being patriotic, by being loyal, by, uh, so to speak, towing the line, doing the right thing, being adaptable. This is a time that we have to, to serve. Daddy's serving, family is serving. So that, those values are transmitted to the family through the spouse, but also just through the organization that they belong to themselves. The respect for authority, uh, being self-sufficient, we don't need to lean on anyone, we can handle it ourselves. On one hand, this is great, but on the other hand, too, it's important for us to know that, that there are times when that self-sufficiency needs connection from the community, needs support from the community. Because, let's face it, uh, our families, uh, do need our help, but they need our help in such a way that we are working with them and with other agencies in a collaborative manner uh, to support them, to maintain their trust and confidence. So what is it that we need to do? 
we certainly as a uh, group, as a unit, need to come together, just like you are, to train up, to not let this be the first or the last time that you talk about military uh, children and families and what their needs are, and thinking about, from the perspective of understanding military culture, how does that connect with the services you provide? How does that connect with your ability to engage and outreach to military families? To identify from your current caseloads who's military, who isn't, and what, and ask yourself what specific concerns that family may have as a result of being military that uh, impact their family function and their well-being and their support. So it's important that we, we take a preventative approach that we build our own military competency. It's something that I do ongoing. Um, classes here, classes there, online, discussions with my peers. Uh, all of this helps to, to build and reinforce an understanding. So I think that is really important that we do. Uh, again, approaching our, our families from a strength-based approach, not from the deficit or the weaknesses or all the things that are going wrong, but really, how is it that this mom or this dad has been able to manage um, the care of their children. Uh, yes, there might be some difficulties uh, in terms of communication, but again, looking at how you can support that, support that through some of the evidence-based practices that we are exposed to now, in terms of parenting support, that is key among military families that are in crisis, providing alternatives to violence helping them to learn different ways to communicate with their children, with each other, and also helping the children learn ways to communicate more effectively with their family. Um, how many of you know about the FOCUS program out of UCLA? Just a couple, oh boy. Okay, let's start there. You know, the resiliency training, um, they help families uh, to learn to communicate with each other. Uh, but also help individuals in, within the family to recognize how they're feeling, their stress levels, how the communication, interaction with each other. If they're in the green, they're good. If they're in the yellow, they're, you know, you know having some problems or issues, or I have a, a, a funny feeling that I need help. Or if they're in the red, they're absolutely, you know, a communication blocker. Very simple that can be used not only with military families, but with all of our uh, families that are at risk to help support and give them a way to identify their feeling. Um, there are many tools that I've uh, posted uh, for you to uh, tap into online uh, uh, tools for uh, military training, but then also some resource guides there are a tremendous uh, number of links to social emotional toolkits, things that you can use directly uh, and take and um, creatively use with your, your children and your families. In terms of domestic violence uh, intervention, those of you that are working specifically with uh, couples or with individuals with domestic uh, violence issues, we you know, know for sure that you use your common sense, you use your best practices, but also add to that, again, the understanding of where that individual, uh, whether it's the perpetrator or the uh, spouse, where their mindset is based on their experiences and based on their culture within the military. Okay, I leave now a few minutes for additional questions. Yes, sir. Perfect. Yeah. Um, two or three years ago, I read that the Army wanted was starting a pilot project, uh, making access to uh, um, initial assessments for crit critical incident debriefing to identify, make it easier to help identify those kids that are like in the Midwest and having trouble getting in to see somebody. So they were doing initial assessments on Skype, trying to at least make that initial assessment identify kids that are high risk so that they could mobilize resources for them. Um, do you know if that is still going on or did the Skype uh, assessment program? 
specifically I, uh, the assessment program, I'm not familiar with that, but I do know that uh, there is an upsurge in acceptance by clinicians to using telehealth, um, to using Skype, to using uh, apps and other uh, technology in order to support um, not only the identification, but uh, to support the interventions with individuals. So what uh, you're saying is an increase in professionals that are willing to use this guy. Yes. Do, do we know if there's an increase in uh, the military to utilize those resources, or we don't know? That? Absolutely, the military is utilizing it. I mean, uh, well, like utilizing resources yeah. to, to can make those connections with the, with the family. We have uh, military family life consultants um, who are, in terms of working uh, directly with uh, families as well as with uh, service members, even coming out of theater, um, they are able to Skype and call and um, get immediate help. Um, it's part of our moving towards, you know, and accepting technology as a, a, an adaptable way to, to provide support and service. I still like the face-to-face, -face, but, you know, we're seeing, and sh it's showing that the telehealth, telehealth is, is uh, helping. You the, the, the desire for these guys and gals to uh, be self-reliant. So going, actually going in to a facility makes that just a, that much more difficult. That was the idea, at least, behind what I was reading in creating that Skype initial contact. Um, as, aside from access, yes, access is important, and also confidentiality, too. Um, not wanting to be seen going into the door in the back that's labeled mental health, you know. Uh, and certainly that goes for the children and the families, too. Not wanting to be labeled, oh, that's a military kid. You know, we know he's going to have problems. Um, but to be able to understand and better meet the needs and support that military child and family is is really what our concern is. Um, at USC, we have, a, uh, within our School of Social Work, a concentration, a military concentration, that our second year students uh, who choose go through, and the specific training around military culture, uh, family, substance abuse, uh, mental health issues, in depth, as well as they have field placement uh, within an a organization that's serving military uh, or veterans and veteran families. In addition to that, we have the Center for Innovation and Research on military uh, veterans and their families. And that also is listed in your guide. And that particular uh, segment of uh, the uh, school offers training in addition to research. Uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow there's an all-day training on uh, uh, sexual issues uh, as a result of some of the injuries, uh, TBI, PTSD, and amputations. So there's ongoing opportunity, yes. Could you describe a little more what the support looks like for the families you know, that are there waiting or when the military, active military comes back after deployment? Well, um, there are a lot of different activities and support, but I think utilization of those activities is something that I've seen um, um, that's less than what we would see if we were a, a community where we had a, a base. Again, um, many of our families don't identify as military, but there's the yellow ribbon, uh, activities for uh, families when their service member is deployed. They come together at the installation. Uh, could be at the armory, it's National Guard. And they have activities for the children. They have um, um, training, discussions for the spouses, uh, also for the service member as well in terms of dealing with transition uh, the fact that you're home now and now this is what's going to be expected. Um, these are uh, different tools. You'll have um, uh, military family life consultants, counselors that will talk with the families about communication, about you know some of the things to expect post deployment coming home. Um, yes. So, um, given that the increase of 
child abuse during the time that the service uh, person is deployed is so high, uh, 40%. What kind of preventative services, and I hear that some of the services are underutilized because it's voluntary, but what kind of preventative services does the military, I guess, um, do they have some type of program where they visit the home? I and mean, some of those groups are kind of, you know, with other members they, that might be and to get somebody out of their home to do that when maybe they're overwhelmed or maybe even depressed or right, is, right. Is exactly there, there are some intervention programs there's like new parent support for uh, families that have been identified as being at higher risk um, many are utilizing that and it, it is an in-home support um, we have some agencies that are uh, providing also that in-home support. Dee Dee Hirsch, um, Community Mental Health has the MFAR program and um, primarily Glendale, um, South Central Inglewood site, but we've been training their staff throughout. So, uh, Pacific clinics also. So I think now we're seeing more and more mental health agencies wanting to step out and work with that specific population. Um, number one, just asking the question with their current uh, clients, are you military, and taking a look at that. And then going from there in terms of their uh, increased understanding of what that means to the, the family functioning and, and, and mental health within that, that the caregivers. Yes? Um, what about the experience, I know the percentages teeth the other way, but what about the experiences of non-service member uh, husbands or fathers who are left taking care of the children while their service member spouse uh, goes into is deployed. I sense. I, I imagine there's a sense of isolation around that. Do, do you have any insights on that? Just out of all. I mean, I had uh, uh, spoke with a the family. They they called again. This is when I had uh, uh, outreach resource hub and would get calls not only from service providers but from service members as well asking about uh, issues related to their child enrollment, you know, child coming from a gifted program in Florida and wanting to maintain that, you know, in uh, the LA Unified School District. But I had a call, a family, uh, father was facing uh, having to take care of his nine-month-old baby uh, as his wife was being, going to be redeployed within the month and that was very frightening for him because he had no support her family was back east they were here um didn't really know their neighbors you know go to work and come home go to work play with the baby and come home that kind of environment so we talked to him about um and connected him with some mommy and me groups <laughs> and um they had uh, a child care provider uh who also uh there were other parents within that child care uh, program that also he was able to reach out to and get some support. Um, but that is certainly an issue too. Uh, what do you do about when it's daddy that's having to, to comb the hair and take care of the kids and make sure that they manage and juggle on time? Because we do you know, have close to now 15% women that are in active duty and are leaving their babies. We also have LGBT families. Absolutely. Exactly. Um, what, what about this dueling kind of uh, conflict of values to a certain degree that you have the families that uh, that the loyalty is stressed, and yet there's this stress from having uh, having uh, all these issues. Uh, is, does the divorce rate turn out to be relatively the same as the general population, or or how do those conflicting senses of loyalty versus the the trauma of, of, of all the things they're going through. How does that result? That's an excellent question. Um, and uh, when you could probably imagine that divorce is, you know, uh, pretty high. That that is a consideration, especially among the uh, E1, E4 level service members. That's the, the lower level. Um, stress are high, pay is low. Um, deployments impacting, you know, uh, even more so than with maybe some of the officers and, and those would have other resources. Um, we do see uh, the dual marriages, increase in dual marriages, but I think in, in terms of who fares better in divorce, it is still the man. 
that there is better in the divorce because even with the remarriage, that uh, female uh, former spouse um, is, you know, again at higher risk for, you know, uh, more difficulties. Uh, yes. I just wanted to make a plug that the, the research that I've seen is that the people that come back from deployments who do the worst are people who have previous traumas. Um, and that's, I think, where most of us work is when people have these earlier traumas. And so if they have those, and if we can do our best to do what we do, but more, I'm preaching to the choir here, but get our private practice colleagues to do some more um, pro bono work, to do trauma work with our just general population, when they do get deployed, they come back and they actually do quite well. Um, only about 25% of returning soldiers actually have PTSD. Right. When they come back, they're profoundly impacted and the suicide rate is high. But three-fourths of them are great and they're better community members. Exactly. And so I think it underscores the importance of the trauma work that we do every single day because um, the resilience is so high when they do well. Absolutely. One of the things that we are have noticed that, that in the early years of uh, post 9-11, um, because we are volunteer arming, our, our numbers were low. And so people that would ordinarily not be accepted because maybe they had a low level crime um, or they had you know, some uh, passable mental health issues, uh, they were allowed in to service. So you had people that um, probably had a lot more, were not screened as if it was you know, uh, uh, it, it was screened as if a volunteer army versus uh, enlistment. So we have people that had multiple traumas. There have been reports of gang members and tagging in Afghanistan. What are the consequences? Yeah, for the military person, do they do the classes? Do they do counseling? Because it's confidential. If it's confidential, the individual you know uh, that has been victimized is, that gets support, gets counseling, uh, treatment.